Hi, John from FlyAtMikeAlpha.com. Today we're going to talk about the power curve and how it relates to flying and us as pilots. Key and Arbor Tower, right turn northbound, approved runway 24, clear for takeoff. Rare contact, clock 01. The power curve is really just a relationship between speed and drag. So we're going to go ahead and draw a standard little graph here. Bottom axis is going to be our speed, and our vertical axis is going to be our drag. As you might have already heard, or might be able to guess, the faster we go, the lower angle attack we need, we can lower our nose, and we have less drag induced on us by lift. So our lift drag actually decreases as speed increases. So at a higher airspeed, lower angle of attack required to maintain the same amount of lift, therefore there's less drag. Lower airspeed, we have to raise our nose, kind of plow through the air, we generate a lot of drag. So at low speeds, we have lots of drag from uh, our angle of attack or our lift, our induced drag curve. And at high speeds, we have very little drag from lift. And we can be fancy here and call this lift drag, LD. For our parasitic drag, that's the other type of air, drag the airplane experiences, very similar to you putting your arm out the window, uh, driving through your neighborhood, and you feel a little bit of wind pushing back on your arm. Then you get onto the highway and you put your arm out the window and you feel it being pushed back substantially by much more air. So the faster you go, the more drag there is on your arm. That's just form drag or parasitic drag, equivalent to the landing gear on the airplane, the wheels and tires, the antennas and just the general surface, the form of the airplane, the windshield, your uh, wing struts, all of those types of surfaces that create substantially more drag the faster you go. So at low speeds, we have very little parasitic drag, little drag on your arm at low speeds, and at higher speeds, it increases and goes up substantially. We'll be fancy here and we'll call that parasitic drag or PD. Then we can go ahead and add these two curves together to get our total drag. And how are we going to do that? Well, we'll just go ahead and make up some fancy drag numbers here. We'll call this a drag factor of one. Maybe put a drag factor of two here. Up here, we'll put a drag factor of, say, 10. And we'll go up here and take our drag factor of one or drag factor of 10 or so, and we'll put a little line right, or a little dot right where 11 should be. Down here, we've got a drag factor of two from our parasitic drag a drag factor of two from our induced drag, or drag from lift angle of attack, and so we put a little dot right around four. And you can kind of see where this is going. We can add these two together here. We'll get another little dot there. So we can connect all these dots, and we can get a curve that we'll go ahead and call total drag, TD. And this isn't exactly the most precise graph, but you're getting the picture here. So we can see that we actually have higher drag at lower air speeds, this is the back side of the power curve, then we hit our minimum drag point, and then the faster we go, again, we increase lots of drag, which is what we would expect, we can only go so fast. But the surprising part here is, at lower air speeds, there's a lot of drag on the airplane. And so let's talk about what that means to us as pilots. Well, let's say these drag numbers are horsepower ratings. So we're just gonna call this 100 horsepower. It happens to be the power that your average 150 puts out. We'll draw a line straight across here. That means our little 150 cannot operate on other side, on the other side of this line or this line. We'll go ahead and call this zero knots for airspeed. And we'll call this, oh, about 100 knots, your maximum forward speed for your average Cessna 150. This right here is roughly about 70 knots. So what do all these numbers mean? Well, this makes sense. If we push the throttle full forward, step on the gas, go as fast as we can, drag increases as we go faster, we can't go any faster. 100 knots is our top speed. Here's a good example of the top side of the power curve. Basically, full power is set, we're in level flight, and the airplane can't go any faster. We can't climb at this airspeed because that's all the power we have. Now I could yeah. trade my airspeed for altitude, I could decrease my airspeed and climb here, but I'm still in level flight and I'm going about 90 knots. If I wanted to climb, 
I could pull back on the controls with full power set, lower my airspeed to say about 70 by, and we can see we have a positive rated climb going. The biggest key is to always stay on the bottom part of the drag curve, right around that 70 miles an hour, 70 knots, depending on your aircraft. Best glide speed, minimum drag, that's going to be your best chance to keep a positive rated climb going with the power available. If you get too slow, you won't be able to climb. If you get too fast, you won't be able to climb. So, really, airspeed control is king, and you'll hear that throughout your training. Airspeed is king. That's just what it's going to be. Over here, we can see that right around, oh, well, maybe about 30 knots or so, we can't go any faster than that airspeed. And here, we see our minimum drag right around 70 knots, and we happen to know that number because that's our best glide speed. So, Best glide speed, minimum drag, makes a lot of sense. If you want to go really far, you want less drag on the airplane, you want to shoot for that number. Any slower, and you're going to have more drag. Any faster, you're going to have more drag. So you have to aim for that number. You'll hear your flight instructor tell you multiple times as you train for uh, engine out procedures and pretend uh, engine failures that you need to aim for your best glide immediately, then find a place to land, and then troubleshoot your engine problems. So. What does this 30 knots represent to us? Well, if you're far enough along in your training and you've already tried some power on stalls, you probably realize that the airplane stalls right around 30-ish knots or so indicated airspeed. So that means that we actually try to fly the airplane slower and slower and slower, drag builds up eventually, our full power, 100 horsepower engine can't overcome that drag and the airplane stalls. So here's a good demonstration of our power curve. We have 20 degrees of flap set, we're going to go to 30 degrees of flaps on final because we're a little high, and then we start getting dangerously slow and the airplane starts sinking at a kind of a scary rate. And we decide we really don't like that and we want to go up and we pull back. But the airplane ultimately gets way too slow and just sinks even more. We're on the back side of the power curve and it could even stall like it did there with a little bit of a buffet. To go up, we could apply full power. Power here, but if our nose is too high, we're still on the back side of the power curve, too slow, too much induced drag, the airplane simply will not climb. We have to lower our nose, pick up some airspeed, get a positive increasing airspeed, and then we can establish a positive rate of climb, just raising the nose about level with the horizon where it normally would be. And of course, 30 up to 20 degrees of flaps is also helpful right away to get rid of some of that drag. Once you have a positive rate of climb, you can go 20 to 10 and then eventually 10 to 0. So, what do we want to realize here as pilots? Ultimately, when we come in for approach, we're probably aiming right around that 70 knots, and if we get much slower than that, we'll actually have to add power because we're increasing drag. So if we make an approach to landing and say we're dangerously slow at 45 or 50, then we'll actually have substantially more drag. And you'll notice this when you get into your short field approaches, you'll have a slower approach speed, more flaps in, maybe 30 or 40 degrees of flaps, and the airplane sinks like a rock because of all this drag. It takes a lot of power, and as soon as you reduce that power, the airplane just falls right down onto the runway. So the other thing to realize here is that if you are in this region of uh, the backside of the power curve, this region of high drag on the airplane due to low airspeed and lots of induced drag, you're going to have to get rid of that drag somehow, and you're going to have to speed up. Now, if you're on the backside of the power curve and you're already using the full 100 horsepower and you're set to full throttle, the only way to increase your airspeed at that point, since you're out of power, is to just lower the nose and trade altitude for airspeed, build up some airspeed, decrease the drag, and then you'll have some available power in the distance between your speed and the drag and the total power that the engine's putting out will become the extra power to help you climb away from the ground. Here you'd be holding altitude, here you'd be holding altitude, and if you tried to go any faster, you'd have to set full power and descend to go faster than 100 knots. Here, you would have to set full power and also descend, or you'd stall. So, ultimately this means for us, when we're coming into land, say on a go-around procedure, we want to execute that earlier rather than later, because if you were, say, 20 feet above the ground and dangerously slow, and you decided at that point to apply full power and go around, you may not have enough power to actually climb with 30 degrees of flaps or 40 degrees of flaps set in a very high nose attitude with a high induced drag. You would have to lower your nose and trade altitude for airspeed to get nearer your minimum drag so you could climb, get onto the front side of the power curve and climb away from the ground. 
That could be a problem if you're only at 20 feet and you don't have much altitude to trade to get that airspeed. That's why it's crucial to make a decision earlier on during the approach at 100 or 200 feet, if it's going badly, to go around, so that if you do need to build airspeed and trade altitude for airspeed, you have it available to you. You have to realize that if you're dangerously slow and you decide to go around and you apply full power, the airplane may continue descending. It may not climb because you're simply inducing a lot of drag by going so slowly. So to go up, we have to go down first. Very counterintuitive, very tough for many pilots, and very emotionally tough for student pilots to get over pushing the airplane down, looking at the ground more, especially when you're so close to it. But that is how we get the airplane to climb. And your flight instructor knows that and will often be pushing forward on the controls at which you think would be the worst possible time. You think, oh my gosh, there's the ground, pull back. But oftentimes by pulling back, we move further onto the backside of the power curve, create more drag on the airplane and get even closer to the ground. That is why we often push forward to build airspeed and then climb away. In stalls, we push forward to recover the airplane, lower the angle of attack, lessen the drag, build up airspeed, and then climb away from the ground. So your takeaway here is that slow airspeeds equal high drag, high airspeeds equal high drag, but the more dangerous of the two would be those slower airspeeds. Because slower airspeeds, you don't have a whole heck of a lot of options. Remember, you can always trade airspeed for altitude. You can trade your altitude for airspeed. If you don't have either one of those, you're in deep trouble. So make sure you either have altitude or you have airspeed. You don't need a lot of either one, but you need enough in reserve to do what you need to do and keep the airplane from coming down to the ground too quickly. So backside of the power curve, everything, from here on back, backside of the power curve, this is the front side of the power curve. We want to stay on the front side of the power curve for most operations. Obviously during landing, we come onto the back side, that's okay. Just don't get too far back and do a high drag scenario. And remember, the slower you go, the more power it takes, add that power in there. Power controls altitude, pitch controls airspeed. When you want to go faster, push the nose forward. When you want to go up, push the power in. There's no other way around it. Hopefully this makes good sense. If it doesn't, leave your questions in the comments below. Make sure you give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you get to fly every day. And if not, then fly mikealpha.com. See y'all next time.